Did you know that the FBI has a world-class code-breaking team? Basically, their job is to decode any encrypted evidence. So imagine coming across a piece of evidence that appears to have secret messages embedded inside of it. It's the job of these brainiacs on the decoding team to go in there and figure out what those secret messages are. Now, this decoding team is incredibly good. But periodically, they do run into riddles, if you will, that are just way too difficult and they can't figure them out. And when this happens, they will often appeal to the public and say, hey, anyone out there, if you can solve this riddle, let us know. And so today's story will involve one of those types of impossible riddles. And if you stay till the end of the video, you'll actually see the mystifying evidence. And I'll show you where you need to go online to literally help the FBI solve this riddle. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, the next time the like button takes their full kitchen trash bag out to go out to the dumpster, immediately throw an open container of clam chowder into their empty can before they can come back and put a new bag in. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. At around 5 o'clock in the evening on June 25th, 1999, a man named Ricky McCormick stumbled into an emergency room in St. Louis, Missouri with his hand over his chest complaining that he couldn't breathe. He said he had asthma and earlier that day he had been cutting the grass and so maybe that had caused a flare up. But either way, here he was in a lot of discomfort saying, you know, I need help. Ricky was 41 years old, and for his whole life, he had had heart and lung problems. And so him arriving in this state in the ER was actually not all that uncommon for him. And so this hospital did what they did with anyone who came in complaining that they couldn't breathe. They immediately took Ricky to a back exam room and they hooked him up to all these monitors to make sure his heartbeat was steady and that his oxygen levels were plenty high. And once Ricky was in the exam room getting hooked up, he started acting really agitated and he kept looking around the room like he was scared that someone was gonna jump out at him. And he was also sweating profusely. And whenever he did speak, he spoke so quickly, no one could really understand him. But despite Ricky's odd behavior, the heart monitor showed his heart was beating steadily, his oxygen levels were perfectly fine, and when the doctor came in and examined Ricky, even though he clearly saw that something was off about Ricky, there wasn't any sign that there was anything physically wrong with Ricky. And so the doctor and the nurses agreed that whatever was going on with Ricky had to be psychological. And as it happened, Ricky did have a long history of psychological issues. He was known for making things up all the time, just telling people these crazy stories about himself, like how he was this talented singer and he was about to go on tour, or that he was actually a prince, or that he was studying to be a doctor. I mean, things that nobody thought was true, but Ricky would say as if this is just common knowledge, this is who I am. And so Ricky's family for the longest time had just assumed that Ricky was either bipolar or maybe schizophrenic. Those are both serious mental health disorders that totally disrupt normal thinking. But Ricky, despite being encouraged by his friends and family to go get help, never got help for any of his psychological issues. And so Ricky's life had kind of gone off the rails. He had dropped out of high school and not gone back to any sort of schooling, and he had spent some time in jail. Now, Ricky was living in a low income, very dangerous part of St. Louis, which is a big Midwestern city on the Mississippi River that in 1999 had a very serious issue with gang violence. Ricky absolutely hated it there, but he had no way to actually leave St. Louis. In fact, Ricky didn't even have his own place. He bounced around from his mother's place, his aunt's place, and his girlfriend's place. Ricky did work, but the work was very sporadic, and it was, for the most part, just night shifts for random odd jobs. And when Ricky was actually working, he really just spent his time chain-smoking cigarettes and drinking literally gallons of coffee. Back at the ER, Ricky, who was still in the exam room, had only been there for less than an hour when the doctor came back in and told Ricky that he was okay and he was going to be discharged. Now, Ricky immediately said, no, no, I have to be here tonight. I need to stay here. You need to admit me. 
but the doctor just kind of ignored what he said and handed him the discharge paperwork. 15 minutes later, when a nurse came back into the exam room to get this paperwork from Ricky, she would walk in and see Ricky still sitting on the exam bed, kind of fidgeting around, looking down at this paperwork on his lap that immediately she saw he had not filled out. He had just signed his name at the bottom. And when she walked in, Ricky looked up at her and he kind of shrugged his shoulders and looked at her and was like, I don't know how to read or write, can you help me? And so the nurse immediately felt bad for Ricky. I mean, he's got dirty clothes on, he looks thin and frail. He's clearly very down on his luck. There's some issues happening with this guy and he can't even fill out his discharge paperwork. And so she said, no problem. She sat down with him and together they filled out his paperwork. And then afterwards, when she walked him out of the exam room back to the front of the hospital, Ricky turned to her and said, you know, instead of going home, can you just let me stay here in the lobby just for tonight? And this nurse who knew she was not allowed to do this, she looked around and saw it was not a busy night there. And so she said, okay, as long as you don't bother anyone, you can stay here. And so Ricky thanked her repeatedly and then walked over to the corner, kind of far away from the front desk and far away from the front door. And he sat down and folded his arms and then he just stared at the front door. And so this nurse assumed that Ricky actually must be homeless, especially based on, you know, how he came in and how he was acting. And so she figured, you know, he needs a place that's warm to stay tonight. And so the nurse went back to her station and over the course of the next several hours, she would periodically look out into the lobby, expecting to see Ricky kind of curled up asleep in the corner. But every time she looked out there, Ricky was still sitting upright, arms folded, staring at the front door of the hospital as if he was expecting someone to come in at any moment and he needed to be ready. And so she thought this was unusual, but she decided not to intervene. She just let him sit there and do his thing. Later that morning at 11.30 a.m. when the nice nurse who had allowed Ricky to stay in the lobby was leaving her shift, another crew of nurses came in and right away they noticed Ricky was just sitting in the corner for no apparent reason. And when they walked up to him to ask if he was okay, you know, what are you doing here? What can we do for you? Ricky, instead of trying to talk to any of these nurses, just got up and walked out of the hospital. After leaving the hospital, Ricky walked to a nearby payphone and he called his girlfriend, Sandy. And when Sandy picked up the phone, she immediately recognized her boyfriend's very familiar voice, but she also picked up that he sounded really tired and kind of out of it. And so when she asked him, you know, are you okay? What's going on? Ricky would tell her that he had just spent the night in the hospital, but he didn't clarify that he had spent the night in the lobby of the hospital, not admitted as a patient at the hospital. But to Sandy, it really didn't matter because already this was raising red flags for her because this was actually the second time that Ricky had gone to the ER just that week. Just a few days earlier, Ricky had been released from a different hospital in St. Louis after telling doctors there that he had had these chest pains and he couldn't breathe. And so he had been admitted for a couple of days, but ultimately they determined that there really was nothing wrong with him. And they too believed whatever was happening with him had to be psychological. And so he had been released. Additionally, Sandy had been growing increasingly worried about Ricky because over the last several weeks, Ricky had begun acting really paranoid to the point where anytime he was in her apartment and somebody outside the apartment just walked down the hallway, Ricky would jump as if he was worried whoever was out there was going to barge in at any moment. But whenever Sandy asked Ricky, you know, what's going on? Why are you so paranoid? He refused to elaborate. So feeling very concerned about Ricky, on this phone call, Sandy would say to Ricky, please come to my apartment and let me take care of you. If you're not feeling well, I'll make you feel better. Just please come to my apartment right now. But Ricky said no, he did not want to go to Sandy's apartment. He told her instead he was going to walk to a nearby gas station to get a bite to eat. And then afterwards he would give Sandy a call. And so the two of them agreed to this plan. They hung up. But then Ricky did not call Sandy later. A worker at the gas station where Ricky said he was going would later tell authorities that Ricky did come into the gas station and he got a hot dog on that day, the 26th. And then the next day, the same worker said, yep, we saw Ricky again on the 27th. He came in here, he got a bite to eat, and then he left. But after that, Nobody saw Ricky, not his aunt, not his mom, not his girlfriend. He didn't show up in any other emergency rooms in Missouri. He just disappeared. 
On June 30th, so three days after Ricky was last seen at this gas station, a woman was driving her car 20 miles north of St. Louis on this highway when she looked out into this cornfield that butted up against the highway and she saw kind of in the middle of it was this dark shape that looked totally out of place. And so she was intrigued enough that she actually pulled over on the road, she got out and began walking into this cornfield to see what this thing was. And when she got up to this thing and saw what it was, she froze in horror and then she screamed, turned around and ran back to her car and she flew to the nearest gas station, she grabbed a payphone and she called 911. When the police arrived at this cornfield, they too walked out towards this dark thing and then finally they saw what this thing was that had scared this woman. It was a dead person who was lying face down, their body was very badly decomposed, and in fact, their body was just kind of falling apart, like the fingers of this person's body had just kind of crumpled off of their hands. Now, based on what this person was wearing, they appeared to be male, but there was no way to tell how this person died or really how long they had been dead for. But despite the advanced decomposition, authorities were able to get a good fingerprint and it would turn out that this body belonged to Ricky McCormick. The day after Ricky's body was found, the police would come out and say they were treating his death as a homicide. This area along this highway in this cornfield was actually a fairly common place for murderers to dump their victims. And it was very unlikely that Ricky had gotten there by himself. He didn't have a car. In fact, he didn't even have a driver's license. There was no public transportation that could have brought him to this spot. And if Ricky had decided to walk to this area for some reason, it was a solid 15 miles from where he lived and worked. Also, Ricky's body was way too decomposed relative to when he had last been seen alive, just three days earlier. And so there was a theory that perhaps he was killed somewhere else and then kept indoors in heat and that had accelerated his decomposition and that at some point whoever had killed him had moved his body and dumped it in this cornfield. And so on that first day of the homicide investigation, July 1st, the police put 18 detectives, so a ton of detectives, on this case, and they also appealed to the public to come forward if you had any information about what could have happened to Ricky McCormick. But just a day later, on July 2nd, the police came out and made an announcement that, you know, after looking at all the evidence and looking at Ricky's body again, it did not appear, in fact, that he had been murdered, but instead he must have died of natural causes. This is a guy that had lung and heart problems, and so that is likely what killed him case closed. And so after this announcement, all of the evidence in Ricky's case was bundled up, put into storage, and people just kind of forgot about it. Six months later, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, got a tip that involved Ricky McCormick. They were working on a case in St. Louis, Missouri about this major drug dealer who apparently was ordering hits on his rivals and a confidential informant came forward and told the FBI that this guy, Ricky McCormick, had gotten wrapped up with this major drug dealer but they didn't really know what role Ricky was playing with this drug dealer. It was just kind of a rumor on the street that, you know, Ricky was involved somehow. This did not make any sense to the FBI because they're thinking, why would this big time drug dealer who really was a mover and shaker in St. Louis get involved with this guy, Ricky McCormick, who was obviously deeply mentally ill and borderline homeless? I mean, what role could Ricky play for this drug dealer? But the FBI still did follow up on this tip because it was very credible. And when they spoke to the local police who had investigated Ricky's death, they got Ricky's file, which meant they got all of the evidence. And immediately the FBI realized the local police had overlooked a very strange piece of evidence found in Ricky's pocket. This strange evidence was quickly sent to FBI headquarters in Quantico, Virginia, and it landed on the desk of a forensic analyst named Dan Olson. Dan was relatively new to the FBI, but he was highly disciplined and very methodical. 
And so when he received this piece of evidence, he got to work right away trying to figure out what it was, you know, what it meant in relationship to Ricky and this drug dealer. And, you know, maybe does it answer the question of how these people are connected? But despite his best efforts and calling in the experts and using every computer program to analyze this evidence, he just could not figure out what it meant. At the same time that Dan was doing this, the big drug dealer who was the target of that big FBI investigation in St. Louis was arrested on gun and drug charges. And so the big case was now over and suddenly trying to figure out what connection Ricky McCormick had to this drug dealer was kind of irrelevant because the drug dealer was behind bars and Ricky was already dead. And so the FBI kind of put a pause on trying to figure out what this evidence was. And so Dan, even though he was really curious now, he was fully invested in trying to figure out what this thing was, he realized he had to give it up too and move on to something else. And so the strange evidence went back into storage, and once again, everyone just kind of moved on from Ricky McCormick. But Dan never really forgot about this mystifying piece of evidence. It was always in the back of his mind. 22 years later, Dan Olson had now become very senior at the FBI. He was actually in charge of their cryptanalysis and racketeering unit. Basically, he was in charge of the people at the FBI who specialized in code breaking, meaning they were the people that would pull any sort of secret messages embedded inside of evidence. And so at some point after taking over this unit, Dan pulled out of storage this strange piece of evidence connected to Ricky McCormick. And he said, you know what? I just need to know what this means. I have to figure it out. I've never been able to. It's haunted me ever since. And so Dan went public. He went to the media and he asked the world to take a look at this mystifying piece of evidence and come forward if you have any idea what it means. When Ricky was discovered in that cornfield, the local police quickly emptied his pockets. And in his pants pocket were two documents that contained an incredibly complex cipher or code. It was basically 30 lines on each piece of paper with different symbols and letters and capital letters. I mean, it looked like total gibberish to the untrained eye, but to people like Dan and his code breaking team, these symbols and letters could mean there was a secret message hidden inside of these documents if you could break the code system. But of course, no one could ever break that code. So how in the world does a guy like Ricky, who is basically functionally illiterate and can only write his name, he's clearly mentally ill and he's not really in touch with reality all the time, how does a guy like that come to be in possession of these complex ciphers? And if he didn't write these ciphers, because that's possible, maybe somebody else gave them to Ricky, well, why would anyone who came up with this very complex cipher entrust a guy like Ricky to be the one to carry these things around? I mean, presumably they contain confidential information that's been very carefully hidden inside of the cipher. And so why give it to Ricky? He's such a liability. And also, what happened to Ricky in that cornfield? I mean, we don't even know how he got there. We don't know how he was killed. All we know is that he had these ciphers in his pocket when he was found. And so many people believe, including law enforcement, that the answer to, you know, what happened to Ricky and what was his connection to this drug lord in St. Louis, if any, or, you know, what was he up to, will all be solved if we can just figure out what these two ciphers mean. But as of right now, no one has solved the riddle of what these two ciphers mean. All we know is that Ricky McCormick, a couple of weeks before he died, became increasingly paranoid and was so scared of someone or something that he was likely running into these hospitals just to hide out. But eventually, whoever or whatever Ricky was scared of very likely caught up to him and killed him. But until we crack these ciphers, we very likely will have no idea what actually happened to Ricky McCormick. Today, the FBI has set up a special website where you can look at these two ciphers that Ricky had in his pocket. And if you're able to crack them, because someone's going to eventually, you can tell the FBI through this website and potentially help solve Ricky's murder. To go to this FBI website, click the link in the description below.
So that's going to do it. If you enjoyed today's story and you want to hear more stories like it, be sure to check out our podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, which has hundreds more stories, many of which are exclusive to the podcast. So if you want to listen to those stories, again, it's called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, and it's available exclusively on Amazon Music.